Hi, I got to sit down with Jennifer Montone at her home in Philadelphia, where she told me about the various twists and turns of her career. Her story is a little complex in that she's endured two different injuries and is currently dealing with a third one. What I like about Jen's story, and I think you will too, is how honest she is about her fears and desires, how she conquers performance anxiety, and how she succeeds in some of the most precarious of situations. She just always seems to prevail. She is, and I will quote her husband, a bull. So, Jen, you've been through a lot of different injuries. Yes. And you've always fought through them and come back. What, what happened in your first injury? Yeah, thank you, um, and thanks for having me. Uh, so I was in a car accident, a really weird car accident with my sister driving, um, and I had my feet up on the dashboard, which is a terrible idea, and uh, I was looking this way, because um, I was talking with her, and then someone rear-ended us, which kind of knocked my back out, having the feet up on the dashboard, and also then my jaw, like, slid, and... Yeah, so it didn't actually hit anything. There was no impact on my face, but what happened was this whole side of my jaw uh, got very stretched out and this side got very compressed and locked in. And so um, then afterwards it was like my doctor just, you know, I went to the dentist, I went to the doctor and I was like, I'm feeling some jaw pain. And they're like, well, just, you know, like maybe wear a mouth guard. So I got one of those and they're like, don't chew anything too hard. I was like, it's like, good, I hope it's fine. Um, but then I started to play and I started feeling quite a lot of intense pain like I was feeling throbbing in the masseter muscle I was feeling some um, like intense like spiking shooting sharp pains up here in the temporalis muscle and um, and especially when I played high and stopped and muted so anyway so I stopped playing the accident was like you said in 04 in October and I stopped playing for about a month thought it would get better um, and started going to see this oral facial specialist who did a lot of exercises and to strengthen some of the um, some of the muscles like yeah okay, um, I saw a lot of doctors that year I learned so much oh my god yeah so it's all very fascinating like, I need to get back yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I need to get back like I quickly. And like, yeah, I was, um, I was up for tenure in St. Louis at the time for Ooh, principal so horn there. So it was like, I kind of need to get back and win this job, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so they were incredibly kind to me. Like they gave me tenure right as I came back from the injury, which is nuts. Um, so I was really, really lucky. And they were, and my colleagues there were super supportive, which was great. Um, but yeah, it was very interesting because I started, uh, I just kind of threw the book at it. Like I went to see a bunch of massage people. I went to see some craniosacral um, therapists. Yeah, because apparently your hips and your, um, you know, uh, rotators up here, they're all on, um, on the same rotational kind of thing. And so when you hurt this, you hurt this and vice versa. So, which is interesting. Yeah. Which means you can unlock it that way too. So if you have jaw pain, you can help it by like easy, you know, opening up your hips and going rollerblading and stretching out your hips and it can transfer and vice versa. I mean, like, so if I stretch or hurt my hips from running, that can affect my jaw? I think so. Pain. Yeah. So you went to two doctors though in St. Louis and then... A uh, performing arts clinic that is in, you know, at the Cleveland Institute of, I mean, sorry, the Cleveland Clinic. clinic. They have a performing arts clinic. The head of that um, clinic, which, is, but his name was Richard Lederman, and I see him till March, sort of between November and March. I like kept on trying to come back and play, and then I'd get the sharpshooting pains or the th dull throbbing pains, and then I would go back out again. So I was mostly off from work from like October till May. That must have been really frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to know what to do with yourself, and really it's hard scared. to know if you're doing all the right things. Yeah. Like, really scared, like, will I ever be able to come back kind of feeling? Yeah, I was worried, and I guess... Um, I, I hated the feeling of not being able to trust my body. It's like, well, what if it, you know, what if it, like, never, what if the pain never goes away? What if this is too much for it, and what if I just can't? you know, do yeah. what I need to do. I do. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it was a lot of, um, 
I ended up doing a lot of exercising and a lot of meditation and a lot of yoga and a lot of trying to just get myself to feel more grounded. So and I think you started using your mental like, yeah. strength to help you get through it. Are you, are you, guess, you like, yeah. I said, I need something to help me because the physical isn't there. So you went yeah. like, here. That's well, I mean, I mean, the first thing that happened was I was, <laughs> I felt like, well, the only thing any, uh, the only thing I'm good at, and the only reason anybody likes me is because I play the French horn. Yeah. So now that I can't, <laughs> now I'm completely worthless. And then I was like, kaboom. I'm like, well, that's not good. I can't, I can't live that way. It's like my best trait. Yeah. You shouldn't say that. That's not good. I know. The thing is, is that... um we tie so much of ourselves up in our instrument. It's like, yeah. it's as though it's inside of us and, and we can't, we can't live without it. Right. So that's, that's scary. It's really scary. I know I've been through my own injuries. It's scary as heck. Like, I, yeah. oh, I hate it. Right. I mean, it seems like most of us, I guess I would say we all have something hard that happens. So I love that you're doing this series because... Yeah, I think just all of these emotions get wrapped up in what we do and how we perceive ourselves and everything. And we all hit some roadblock that then you have to either dismantle or <laughs> jump over Wait, or figure out, that? fight through. <laughs> I've got a couple. <laughs> because your, your career started off with really not any much roadblocks because you got a job so young, mm -hmm. 18 or 19. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 20. 20. Yes. Your first job as yeah. a pro musician. Yeah. And well, and I lucked into that because I was too young to be nervous, which is fabulous. Okay. But, but yeah, it felt, it all felt decently easy like, until this first injury. And then all of a sudden everything was very difficult. So, which is interesting. And I guess that's like, we all have our ups and downs at some point. People say, okay so was it, it the but... first time in your life where you were like, I don't know how to play that. I'm scared to play that. Was that the yeah. first time that Yes, and I think just feeling vulnerable is a tough thing about injuries. One thing that was interesting with the coming back from the jaw injury was that um, Richard Lederman, when I went to see him, he put these electrodes all over and said basically that nothing lit up on the electrode machine when I played for five minutes between middle C and middle G and soft. And so he was like, so he had me play a bunch of things and then was like, okay, well, once you got above a G or below a C and once you played loud and once you articulated and once you did all this, yeah, there were red lights showing up on his machine from the electrodes on me. He basically said that the, um, the, the smartest thing to do would be to start for the next month. So beginning of March, I guess is when I saw him play only those notes and only piano and only slurred, which gave me the thought of like, well, what are the aspects of horn playing? And like, maybe I can use this as a rebuild. Like, I'm sure there's bad habits that I've gotten into my playing or things I didn't know about when I was 10, you know, that might be healthier ways to build my foundation. Let me think about what I could actually do better so that I can be healthier for the rest of my career. That's the, like the best thing that came out of that one. Well, so what's incredible to me though, is you went from five minutes a day of only five of a fifth. And then mm -hmm. you were like, you know, I should take an audition for Philadelphia Orchestra. <laughs> I, well, I, I mean, you really? Because I, <laughs> I was thinking about that. I was like, where did she get the confidence to think she could win a principal horn audition? Like, that's insane. Like, right. No, it's a little, it was a little silly. But, um, like, so I started back with that? the orchestra in St. Louis in May. Okay. And then the audition got, you know, uh, you know, put in the paper, I guess, in July or something for October. And you or August, yeah. I was playing back a little bit. So over the course of like March to October, that six months or so was a really nice opening back up into playing again. Oh. And so I kind of, I was working back up into things and then this audition happened and I was like, I've always wanted that job to be open. Like I always wished for that one. I don't know. Maybe I should just have that be a goal. Because you thought I don't have a chance. Exactly. So oh. that's actually... That's you know, exactly. So that's actually, that's you know, the most fortunate things have happened to me when I don't have a whole lot of pressure on myself. Which let's is. let's get to your back injury. So the back injury, when you were talking to me about that before, you you told me that one made you mentally stronger, which I thought was interesting <laughs> because I was thinking if I damaged my face, I would be so freaked out because mm. I have damaged my face before. And when I when I ever damage anything, I'm like below neck below. I'm like, eh, it's okay. At least I can still blow. Right. But so why why did the back injury 
affect your emotionally, yeah. or you want to call it emotional health or mental health? I think it's because it was a bit insidious. It, it was more uh, sneaky. Oh, it snuck okay, up on me. You. Yeah. So I think um, I, after the car accident, I started having trouble playing standing up. Like I remember playing some things in St. Louis, like some duets and stuff. And uh, uh, my sound would quiver. And I was like, I'm not sizably more nervous than I am sitting down. So I don't know what that is. And it was embarrassing. <laughs> and yeah, it started no, getting... I've always been like, if anything, don't shake your sound. I always right. tell that to my students. Yeah, that's yeah. embarrassing. Yeah. And, so and so that was happening before I even felt back pain. Like my back would go out every once in a while. And I knew what that felt like. And, and I knew I had hurt my back at the car accident. But I didn't realize that it was connected to this whole thing with playing and the fact that standing was becoming a problem. Okay. And then soon then bells up became a problem. And then I started feeling more and more pain. Like I was trying to play some off the leg and you know, where was it hurting? Uh, well, so where I ended up having a surgery was L4, L5 and L5 S1. And it turned out <laughs> lower back, super lower. And it turns out that just my discs started slipping as a lot of us have that happened. And then they started to block more and more. So, so, Block the nerve. Block, yeah, it started pinching the nerves and block the spine. Which is very painful. Which is very painful. Yeah. And he was like, well, I'm surprised you didn't want the surgery so far. I think if you want to wait until September when you guys are off from a break, you feel numb in your torso, that's immediate, like must have emergency surgery now. I'm surprised there's... he didn't just tell you to get it. He might have read my stubbornness. Like, I don't like to call him sick, but I should have. I think I wasn't thinking clearly either because of the pain. Like, I was in excruciating pain. One time I like laid down in the middle of a grocery store because I couldn't stand anymore and I couldn't sit and I couldn't do anything and some guy came and prayed over me and I'm like bawling and my two kids are running around like a wild maniacs in the like Jen. frozen aisle like Jen. frozen aisle and some very nice Samaritan is over there like please bless this woman she's clearly in a lot of pain and I was like I was like this is insane Jen. That was the day I like literally got out of the grocery store and I called my personal manager and I was like I need to call in sick now that was when I stopped playing <laughs> That was the day I called in sick. <laughs> I was like, well, that was You're easy. You went <laughs> that, that far? Two weeks ago, yeah. Oh, my so God. I'm an idiot, and that's wow. fine. But... but anyway. I think you're really determined. I don't think you're an idiot. idiot. I think you're really, really strong-headed and determined. Yeah, my husband uh, related me to a bull the other day said that that reminded him of me oh. no but so I finally ended up calling in sick and then I had the emergency wow. surgery and yeah and then it took a while to recover from that immediately felt better yeah they did a laminectomy where they grind down the bones and then and then the discectomy but I think the problem with my mind is that I do visuals a lot and so they showed me this MRI of my spine after it and there's like this big hole in my spine and I just feel that and so actually my physical therapist, no, no, I can't feel it, but I feel that emotionally. I'm like, I have a hole in my spine, right where I'm blowing from, right where I initiate my breath from, where I get all my power and strength from, big hole, you feel big, you weak, like vulnerable. Yeah. And so actually my physical therapist after that, um, I was talking with her and she was having me do something and I started crying and she was like, I know it's hard. And I was like, it's not physically hard. I just, I can't get that image out of my head. And she was like... She immediately went over to her computer and pulled up all of these images of what's the muscles that are surrounding the spine. And there's twists and turns. There's layers and layers and layers and layers of muscles around the spine. And she's like, you are so strong. We all are. There is massive quantities of strength in those muscles. There's nothing that any spinal injury could do that would make you weak down there. And it was incredible because like all of a sudden I was like, okay, I have stuff I can rely upon there. So I've been playing from that spot of like all the twisty turning muscles at the base of our spine. Like, okay. So you found <laughs> yeah. like something to center your focus on. Yeah. That you've got the strength within your body. You just needed to realize it. Yeah. And you strength here. Right. Yeah. And I've been, I've been thinking about it a lot lately in the past couple of years because I'm like, well, when we're trying to feel confident, we can't just like fake ourselves out. We can't really do the like, it's going to be great. It's like, you have to actually believe it because you know it to be true. So when you go through an injury, you're like, I am weakened. I have to get strong for me to feel confident. It has to actually be real. Well, so. let's, let's get to how you stay calm because I really like what you use. And I think it can help a lot of people. Um, you called it your pillars. 
Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I love doing a lot of meditation stuff, and I have some of that on my website. When I'm away from the horn, I try to do a, a decent amount of yoga and kind of <clears throat> like nose breathing to kind of keep your neurological system nose down. Breathing. Yeah, like nose breathing and humming. There's something called the vagus nerve, and it goes throughout your whole body. And when you're feeling frazzled, your vagus nerve is like kind of electrocuting, you know, your whole insides. And when you nose breathe, there's sort of square breathing where you breathe in, hold, two, hold, two. Three, four. And you can do it with rectangles so you can make the holds longer or you can make the inhale and the exhale longer or whatever. But it's like basically that kind of concept or like. Like humming and breathing, kind of nose breathing and humming. If you do that for like 20 minutes, it's a whole neurological reset for your body. I like that you conduct and have a rhythm while you do it. Oh, is that something that they teach in meditation or is that your thing? <laughs> no, it's like, I guess it's what I do when I'm doing it, seems, it with my students. It seems very, um, very like orchestral. Yeah. Your, your meditation. I've never seen any of my yoga teachers <laughs> <laughs> no, in three no. or four. That's really true. Uh, and then, like using so a resource like, and using it to sort of help, music, help the heart. You're using yeah. music with your, with your breathing of meditation. So you're still, you're like, I need this for my music, but you put the music into it too. Yeah. So like you're meddling, you're putting the meditation, you're putting the music into the meditation and then you take the meditation and put it in the music. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to integrate be, it. Yeah. Totally. Oh, I really like that. Oh, thanks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really beautiful actually. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. I find that, so like you were talking about pillars. So the pillars that I feel like are the most stabilizing for us are breath and time. And I think that's the basis of every warm up exercise every ever and all foundational, you know, fundamentals and all that. And so if you do like a walking meditation, and you're feeling how your feet are on the floor and you're feeling calm and grounded and you're walking in a certain rhythm, you can do that on your way to the front of the stage for a concerto or, you know, and, and if you breathe in time, then you're kind of preparing yourself for your initial breath for every excerpt. Like when you have to start a piece like Bruckner four or Brahms piano concerto or something like that, like you have to, I, I start getting the, the rhythm in my head and then I vamp it while we're doing the tuning note and I vamp it while we're bowing and I vamp it while I'm sitting down and then ready and boom. So if I have the breath going and I have the time going, then I have these two pillars that are underneath and I feel stable. So while you're sitting there freaking out about having to come in on high after Bruckner 4, so everyone's tuning and you're going... Or like... Play the A. Great. Stand up and bow. Smile. Sit down. Now look up. He's going to start conducting. Now he's going to start... Now they all, you know, and then, yeah. So basically try to set yourself up with your pillars underneath you. Don't do that. It's so calm. I mean, it makes me feel calm even watching you do it. That's so smart. It feels reliable. No, that's really, because I've always wondered, how do first form players start this? Right. Like, it's that, because I'm, I'm always, you know, sitting by them being like, I am, but I'm not that person. <laughs> but I've never seen, okay, so I've never sat by you when you played that. Well, or can anyone tell you're doing it? Or is it just all in your head? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's probably, I think everybody, and I mean, you do too, for all your second horn solos, it's like you have a mental prep before you play anything that's scary. And so, like, I know we were joking about how, like, when somebody kind of goes into their own cocoon and they're concentrating and they're focusing and they're either breathing or they're, you know, singing something in their head or they're talk talking to themselves in a helpful way, whatever it is, like, you don't want to get in their way and you don't want to make... Oh, I know. Is this your own so. thing you came up with or did someone help you get to this? Or is, did, is it from meditation or is it just your process of what makes you comfortable? It might be some Don Green. So in Don Green's book, the, um, the purple one that I really like, I think it's performance, performance success. In one of his books, anyway, he talks about um, kind of if you can figure out what your optimal energy is and what your normal energy is. So it's like I perform well when I'm feeling energetic, activated, but not too frazzled, not too manic. Where do you say, place. when we talked before, you said, 
I don't want my energy level to overwhelm what I need to do. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that's that's interesting. So your energy level was just hyper, 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 mm -hmm. and you need to bring it down. For most things, I need to bring it down. You Occasionally, I can get it down. Like if I get it down too much, then I sound boring. If you can figure out what your optimal energy is and what your normal energy is. So it's like I perform well when I'm feeling energetic, activated, but not too frazzled, not too manic. And it's like, or whatever. If I'm sort of a blah, 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 kind of person, I could maybe do some deep breathing and get myself focused. If I'm kind of a low energy, shy person, maybe I can listen to the music on the way to the hall so that I get kind of my energy level up. So it's sort of like it's managing wherever you think you naturally come from and where you think your optimal performance energy is and finding where it is. That's a great Which point. Is, yeah. yeah, where's it's your different. optimal performance level? Well, that's really helpful because I, to me, you're one of the calmest people I've ever sat by. Thank you. See, I, I work really hard for that. <laughs> I think everybody's got their own method. I think it can, we can tweak and change our own method and it's kind of a growing, it's a always conversation. Well, I think also it's important to point out to people how hard it is to perform all the time. It's really hard to do because there might be a day when you just don't feel well or you didn't have the time to get your energy level ready yeah. and you have to get it ready on the, on the snap and you're yeah. just like, okay, I actually have to have to go do this right now and I'm not ready to do it but you have to tap into those resources okay yeah. I'm gonna breathe and I can do this you have to give yourself that confidence like the pep talk yeah yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah I need a cheerleader and a pep talk beforehand so like the reason I came up with that thing with the rhythm for the Bruckner 4 was because we did it on tour when I had my back injury so I was in a lot of pain and we were going through Asia and we were doing like Brahms 2, Scheherazade and Bruckner 4 and it was like a lot I brought my family and so I was pushing like strollers and suitcases and like trying to do all this stuff like the, first, the thing that was going through my head is I'm gonna die I gotta get out of here I'm gonna die. Go, just go. Just leave die. the stage. Why? They'll figure it out. You're gonna die, so you gotta go. Die. And I'm like, I gotta. I'm gonna die. I gotta. I gotta go. I'm like, yada. And I'm like, that's not a mental prep. That is not a good mental prep. We're not doing that Why one again. <laughs> yeah, that's where I sort of I started thinking. Okay, my my body's falling apart. I need a stronger mental plan because I'm not feeling like I can rely on my body. But I do have breath. I can breathe. I can subdivide, and that kind of aligns everything. The coordination of things. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not cracking a whole lot of notes because you're aligning things you automatically feel safer and more confident so I think over the last like five years since the back surgery it's been sort of me trying to find physical things that make me feel safe and calm and grounded so like your sits bones sit on your sits bones and if you have to play high you can really depend on like I was talking about that muscular sort of center that's kind of behind and below your belly button <sighs> you know so you can kind of like as you ascend um so I was feeling weakness um, as I would ascend and crescendo. And so then to spin the air. So I got like a breathing bag. I got an Earl Jacobs breathing bag. I already had a breath builder. So I was using that a whole lot. And I got like a foam roller. And I kind of, I, I sort of tried to get to encourage me to like sort of build my strength and build my breathing back so that I feel like I'm actually using my full torso to breathe. What I like about doing the breathing on the foam roller is that you feel your rib cage expanding out this way. And you feel like you're breathing kind of, it's a belly breath, but it also, is a real like rib cage and lung breath it feels like you're opening okay let's get to your third your third thing that you're dealing with because the first two things I kind of was like wow she's been through a lot and I thought you only went through two and then you told me just going through you're going through Thing. It's not really yeah. over. Because yeah. <laughs> I think it's not as big as the other two, which is good. But um, so after the back injury and surgery and recovery soon enough, within a year or so, I'd be playing back to normal. But I still was feeling weakness and hearing some quivers, especially when I stand up. And then I started noticing that I would have some pain here, like right um, kind of in between where your rib cage meets and right around maybe where the your diaphragm is yeah it was normally when I'd be playing super loud in a morning rehearsal and I was like oh okay my first thought was I didn't get a big enough warm-up in I didn't warm up my stomach and it didn't occur to me until after when when we stopped working I was like 
You're never supposed to have pain when you play loud. Even if you warm up poorly, you're still not supposed to have a ripping, shredding feeling in the middle of your stomach when you play loud. I found a brace at home that I had had for my back injury and I, I started wearing it and it felt better when I played and I never had the, I never had the ripping, shredding feeling. And so I was Google searching, they all came up relating to something called diastasis recti, which is um, when your abdominal muscles pull apart during pregnancy. And, and about 50 to 60% of women, they stay apart after you have your kid. Actually, during pregnancy, you can do some exercises to strengthen the abdominal wall as it's growing with a baby. When the baby's born, you can do some strengthening exercises before you go back to work. But <laughs> if you feel like that happened, maybe don't do any heavy lifting. Don't. And I think horn playing can feel like heavy lifting. I think we do similar things to our stomach. And if I had known that, then I would have probably done the exercises. And I found some really nice um, little bands that you can wear when you play. So that's what you're going to do? Is just strengthen it That's and what they're doing. Yeah. Okay. And do you feel? I think it'll be okay. You feel better about it now, or are you I still do. fighting yeah. with it? Yeah, I think for me, whenever I have a, an, a possible answer and some steps towards yeah. a solution, like that's like, all I need to feel, it. right. So overall, what I'm observing from you is that you just don't give up. I love what we do. So I don't want to quit until I'm ready. Yeah, you, so. I mean, because you, you keep finding a way to make it keep going. Did you, in any of, this, in any of these injuries, think I, I should quit? Yes, recently, actually more so than ever before. Oh. I was like, if I can't figure out this one, nobody really needs to hear me sounding mediocre on this chair. Like, I think we all want to do justice to that. So, Speaking of Nikki Cash and her amazing interview, yeah. Oh. then yeah, I would try to be as graceful as she is and as courageous as she is and be like, yeah, okay, yeah. now it's time. I'm going to go do something else. Anyway, I Thank you for sharing with us what you've gone through. I don't think a whole lot of first form players would admit to all their fears the way you have. Or, nor would they keep going the way you have it. I'm trying. <laughs> so, we are on. Yeah. Anyway, well, thank you for this. Thank you for having me. Thank you.